Greg Lawrence. I'm excited to be here because I haven't been in Portland before. I'm excited that there's such a thriving community here. It was very active. I want to thank Helen for inviting me here. She saw that I did this talk in Los Angeles for the AWARE project. So my name is Greg Lawrence. I'm from Los Angeles. I happen to be here because I was in Seattle visiting my girlfriend's family, and Helen reached out and asked me if I'd be interested in doing this talk for you. That's my reason for being here. In Los Angeles, I am an integration specialist, working with people one-on-one. -on -one. I'm an integration circle facilitator. We have discussion groups every week where people get together and talk about their issues, their experiences, how to integrate what they've learned from the psychedelic experience and altered states of consciousness into their daily lives. I also do energy work, transformational coaching. So what I have discovered is a different way of working with the boga. Traditionally, a boga is used in flood, flood dosing, which we'll talk about, and microdosing. I accidentally found out there's a third way to work with the boga, by microdosing and combining that with cannabis. They potentiate each other. So, First, I want to let people know this is be presented for purposes of harm reduction and education only. I don't condone any kind of illicit substance use or illegal activity of any kind. Evoga is serious medicine with serious health considerations, especially in a few cases, and we'll go over those. So please talk to a medical professional or at least do extensive research before you consider putting this medicine into your body. I will give advice on the use of evoga. That will be given on the assumption that you're doing so in a jurisdiction where it's not illegal to do so. <coughs> This is a partial list of the medical risks and contraindications for use of aboga. There's not a lot of research into the risk for using it when you're microdosing. This is for flood dosing, but people, especially with cardiac conditions, should be careful using aboga, especially if you have a QT prolonged condition. We're going to talk about using cannabis in addition to aboga. That lowers blood pressure. That's an added consideration. <coughs> And as you can see, things like, of course, psychiatric disorders, use of SSRIs, epilepsy seizure disorders, diabetes, and so forth. In short, if you're going to use a VOGA, please do your research first and make sure you're healthy enough. I wanted to find a, VOGA, a quote about a VOGA that would describe it from a spiritual perspective. I found this from Tricia Eastman from IndianNation.com. Mm. The VOGA is the vehicle that allows you to sit with yourself long enough to realize that thing you are afraid of is an illusion. I love that quote. And it just in case you missed that, I wanted to repeat it. So, why am I doing this talk? It's so dangerous to use a VOGA if you have health considerations. Interest in and actual use of microdosing is increasing at a rapid pace. To me, microdosing means subtherapeutic or subperceptual, like when you think of microdosing mushrooms. You don't use enough LSD or mushrooms that you're actually on half a trip. But people seem to be doing that with the boga. A lot of people are doing that because they are chasing the flood dose experience. They want something more than microdosing. They're moving into something that's been described as mesodosing, somewhere between microdosing and a full dose. I, micro, I uh, monitor online forums. I've heard people say things like, I'm microdosing 500 milligrams of aboga daily. <laughs> that's not a microdose. <laughs> in a few days, you're going to have a lot of aboga in your system. Yeah. There is a professional website that has advice on microdosing, specifically on aboga, and it says one gram of aboga should be a safe starting point for microdosing. If you've done a gram of aboga, you should probably not be driving, operating machinery, or maybe even walking on your own. After I discovered this combination, I was excited to get online and find out what kind of protocols were in place and what kind of things people were doing with the medicine. I could find nothing. I'm using relatively small amounts of cannabis with relatively small amounts of aboga. So I started putting together information and talking to people, and eventually one of the people from AWARE Project said, why don't you do a presentation? This thing was born. I'm trying to spread the word about this medicine because this medicine is incredibly healing. I have been working with psychedelics heavily for personal development for the last three years, and this is the most important medicine I've worked with. So. Elizabeth Bass' excellent book, Heart Medicine, A True Story, tells the story of her efforts to get her partner, Chor Boogie, off of heroin. He was a relapsed addict. She thought it would end their relationship. She knew about plant medicine. She researched aboga and convinced him this might be a solution. Pretty soon they were in a aboga treatment center in uh, Costa Rica, run by an African shaman named Muginda. This is from page 183. Elizabeth did medicine herself to take a psycho-spiritual journey. I could hear Chor churning in his bed, breathing heavily and groaning softly like someone with a high fever. 
I reminded myself to remain at ease. We were in good hands, I knew. Now, Muganda continued, go back to the house where you were as a little baby, maybe eight months old. Don't ask how you're going to get there, just go. The visions were more vivid now. I could see my crib like a cage and the stark walls of the humble home. Find yourself there, said Muganda. Do you see yourself? There I was. Little me holding on to the bars of the crib, a forsaken, helpless, innocent prisoner. The medicine was stronger now. I struggled a bit to respond with words. Yes. I wanted to hold on to my daddy's fingers, but he was nowhere around. Mother had been gone so long I was worried that she ceased to exist. I had no understanding of time. My little heart panicked and I wondered if I had been left for the vultures. I realized that everything experienced in infancy was infinitely more intense. Events pressed themselves into the tender flesh and budding brains like a brand. What's happening there, Moganda asked. I'm alone in my crib. I feel like I might be there forever. I cry a lot because my tummy hurts. My dad doesn't know how to make me feel better. My mom's gone. She's working and worried about me at home. She knows my dad can't, t can't take care of me, but she has to work anyway. She has to pay the bills. She's worried about money. Now hold that little girl, he said. Tell her you love her. I cradled my spirit, so my little self in my spirit arms and felt her frantic crying settle into sweet coos. I looked at her and admired her purity and imperfection. She was not left in the crib because she was too much. She was left in the crib because her father was not enough, back then at least. He was just fragile. I felt compassion both for myself and my young, war-torn amateur father. I started looking into doing Iboga after reading that. Tabernet Iboga is a perennial rain shrub native to West Africa, Republic of Congo, Cameroon, and Gabon. <coughs> It's not especially a standout plant. It looks like a little bush. It's got these kind of cute little pepper-looking flowers. The real magic of the plant is in the root bark, specifically the inner root bark. When I talk about aboga, I'm talking about powdered root bark. There are extractions, tinctures. There's ibogaine, which I'll talk about in a minute. Those all have different dosages. So when I talk about dosages, when I talk about aboga, I'm talking about root bark, not TA, not an extraction of any kind, and not ibogaine. Iboga contains at least 12 alkaloids. Its main alkaloid is called ibogaine, and this is the difference between ibogaine and iboga. Iboga is the actual plant. Ibogaine is a single alkaloid that's been extracted from the plant. It's a powerful psychoactive tryptamine. It was discovered by the Babango or Pygmy people of West Central Africa. Legend has it that a Babango man trapped a porcupine for dinner. He brought it home and his wife ate the porcupine and was taken on a powerful shamanic journey in which her true spiritual nature was revealed to her. It lasted about 25 hours. She told her husband about it and he wanted to find out what happened so he went back to where they trapped the porcupine and found it had been eating the root of a bush in the jungle. He took that root back to his tribe, gave it to the entire village and they received profound healing and received messages about what kind of plants to use to treat different, medic different uh, illnesses and parasites. They eventually shared their knowledge with other Bwiti practitioners. Bwiti is a spiritual discipline practiced by over a quarter million people in Western Africa. It's actually one of the three official uh, religions of West Africa. It incorporates elements of animism, ancestor worship, Christianity. It's not a monolith monolithic belief system. Even within particular tribes, the beliefs within Bwiti uh, vary quite a bit. But among those that incorporate heavy elements of Christianity, there are a lot who believe that Iboga is the original tree of knowledge referenced in Genesis. Iboga is the sacrament of the Bwiti people. They use it in days-long initiation ceremonies, rites of passages. They believe it helps them to speak to their ancestors. They use it for deep healing. They actually use, use small amounts for a stimulant, not unlike we use coffee. So, after I decided I went, wanted to work with Iboga, I found a center I wanted to work with, called them, and did a phone screening. About a 45-minute phone conversation where they asked about my medical history. They had me fill a lot of forms, including a detailed medical history. They had me see a doctor to get an EKG liver and kidney panel. I told my doctor I was doing that because I was running a marathon. I didn't know what to say. <laughs> I didn't know that my doctor was a marathoner, so when he wanted to talk about what kind of food I was eating, <laughs> I <didn't> know. <laughs> My knowledge of marathons is that it's 26.2 miles. It's 26.2 miles, right? Yeah, see, you know as much as me. Um, so he was kind of confused, and I just dropped the subject. I sent my results off to the treatment center, and I started researching travel, travel dates. On an Iboga flood dose, 
I should note that Iboga is used a lot for uh, addiction interruption. There are people here who used it for that. We're going to talk about the psycho-spiritual side tonight. Yeah, if you want to know about how it's used to treat different opioid, heroin addiction, alcohol, depression, Google it. There's a ton of information on YouTube and on Google. Psycho-spiritual journey is sometimes called a life review or deep breath. Produces an altered state of consciousness. It's been described as a waking dream or dreaming while fully conscious. You can look at your entire life from a totally detached perspective without getting attached to it, without experiencing emotions that usually happen when you do. It, left, it normalizes levels of serotonin and dopamine and repairs those receptors. This is why it treats addiction so efficiently, because your receptors are wiped clean. Your brain is in a highly neuroplastic state following the experience, which is why lasting changes are possible with it. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. The first phase of the flood dose is called the waking dream state. It lasts 48 hours, consists of heavy visions. There's a lot of body heaviness. Aubrey Marcus described it as laying on a plate of syrup with a 500 pound stack of pancakes on it. <laughs> There's a lot of nausea involved most of the time in purging, especially when you move. People are generally very sensitive to light. A lot of people say that their third eye opens during this phase. Even with eye masks on or their eyes closed, they can see movement within the room. People have powerful, highly personalized visions. One person I know is an avid reader, so he saw a giant book, and when he asked, why does this happen, or why do I think this, it turned to a page and showed him what happened in his life. Um. The other person I know is a movie buff. He sat in the theater and asked to see specific scenes from his life. It showed him the scenes, and then it showed him subtitles that showed him why that happened. <laughs> sometimes they're metaphorical, symbolic. Sometimes they're actual memories. People have uh, recalled previously forgotten memories in vivid detail. Unlike other psychedelics, the visions with the boga can be stopped by opening their eyes instantly. In fact, some people open their eyes and the vision stopped. They wanted to be where they were. They closed their eyes and they can't go back. Second state, sometimes referred as to the evaluative or introspective phase. This is where the integration begins. People start thinking about the visions they have and they start to make sense. They connect to events in their life. They tell them the root cause for different behaviors, patterns, addictions even substance addiction. So in addition to repairing physically the receptors and serotonin and dopamine levels, it also helps people reason, uh, recall, realize the reason for the addiction. Third phase is residual stimulation phase. It can last 24 to 72 hours. Psychoactive state fades. Motor skills return to no normal. A lot of people don't need sleep or eat much for the next three to five days. There's a strong afterglow Part of that is because uh, ibogaine metabolizes something called noribogaine. It's like a natural SSRI that metabolizes in your liver. During a flood dose, it stays in there up to six months. Microdosing, I'm not sure how long. Your brain is in a highly neuroplastic state after this experience because ibogaine causes a long-term increase in something called real cell line-derived neurotropic factor, or GDNF. That is a growth hormone that promotes neuroplasticity and neurological re regeneration. So I want to repeat that. Ibogaine causes a long-term increase in a growth hormone that promotes neuroplasticity, neuroplasticity and neurological regeneration. Right now there is research into whether or not ibogaine can be used as a treatment, not a cure, but a treatment for Parkinson's. So what happened with me? I got a call from the treatment center and I found out I was unable to undergo a flood dose for medical reasons. I take a seizure control medication that has to be maintained at a certain level in my blood. What I was told is that this, medi this medicine act sort of wipes the medicine out of your blood. If that happened to me, I might have a seizure and I wouldn't be able to metabolize any medication for the next 24 to 48 hours. Other than that, I was glad I took the test because other than that, I was medically clear. Heart was strong, liver and kidney looked good, that was the only reason. So I thought maybe microdosing would be a good way to go. What happens when you microdose? You have an elevated and stabilized mood, partly because of noribogaine nor building up in your system. You can have increased energy until you build up too much medicine in your system. So if you're doing it for four or five days on a daily basis at a high dose, you can get to where you're kind of foggy and don't know what's going on. It helps you to more easily identify negative thoughts, behaviors, and patterns. You can catch yourself doing things. You can catch behaviors and find out why you're doing things. So it helps people in giving up unhealthy habits or behaviors. It can help you with very vivid dreams. Sometimes it can keep you from sleeping. 
when I microdosed a boga, so I started microdosing. It was a total chill pill at first. I got on the freeway, and the freeways in Los Angeles take a long time to traverse. I was driving for an hour, and I realized I had another hour to get to my destination, and then I realized I didn't care, <laughs> which is really not like me. So I knew it was the aboga. I did have some trouble sleeping, but when I did, I had very vivid dreams. It started building up in my system, and yeah, I hit a wall. I became fatigued. I got groggy, so I backed off. I waited five days, and I took 300 milligrams. I took it kind of late, so I thought I might have trouble sleeping. I smoked cannabis probably two, three times a month. I hadn't smoked it for probably three or four weeks at that point. So I thought I'd smoke a little cannabis. <laughs> I smoked it, laid down, I put on some wiki music. Wiki music is to a boga as Icaros are to ayahuasca. It was engineered and designed specifically to work with this medicine. It's primarily mouth bow, mouth part percussion, and vocals. It is not relaxing medicine songs. It's kind of frenetic and hectic. It's considered a lifeline that reaches from this life to the hereafter and serves as a mean of lo means of locomotion in visionary space, meaning you can move around in the visionary space and it's going to hold you here. It directly influences emotions and visions during the ceremonies. It's polyrhythmic, meaning it has more than one rhythm happening at one time, and sometimes it has binaural beats in it. So, I took 300 milligrams of root bark, laid down, put on some weekly music, smoked a little cannabis, closed my eyes. I don't generally see thoughts graphically, but when I was laying down, well first I should say I was listening to Buiti music, and the first thing I thought was, I don't know why I'm listening to this music, it's really kind of annoying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was not relaxing, I thought about changing it, but I was sort of hypnotized by it. <laughs> After a while I had the distinct feeling that while I was listening to the music over here, I sort of s sneaked out the back door over here to where it was quiet and started thinking. I thought about something someone had said to me a day before, but I thought was kind of critical of me, and I saw it as a line. That person, what they said to me, and how I received it. And I just thought there's got to be more to it than that. When I thought that, it turned on its axis. <laughs> and it blew up into that person's history, their opinion of me, their intention at the time, what they wanted me to receive, what they said, the validity, the lack thereof, my own history, my triggers, my opinion of that person, my receptivity awesome. of the time. And I started sort of multidimensionally analyzing this thing at one point, turning it around and seeing it from their point of view and thinking, yeah, I had that coming. <laughs> At another point, I, I just kept thinking and I thought, I, I asked myself, why do I have this negative opinion of myself, a particular negative opinion? And it showed me, because this thing happened when you were four or five years old, and I remembered it. That's right, that did happen. Then these four or five things happened and it reinforced it. Mm. I thought that makes sense. And then it said, but you ignored these hundreds of things that invalidated that. <laughs> and I didn't see a balance scale, but I saw it falling, and when it did, it fell, and this so much outweighed this that it shot up into the sky, and I no longer had that opinion of myself. Awesome. And a lot of things like that happened that night. So I thought I would read you some experiences I've gotten from people who've tried this combination of medicine. It's just person number one. I went in with a specific issue I wanted to focus on, but when I closed my eyes, I kept thinking about a decision I'd made a couple of weeks earlier. I'd been presented with an opportunity to make a career change. My new job would be much more closely aligned with my values, but would also pay me much less. It would require downsizing my residence and making some major lifestyle changes. I decided it wasn't the right time for that change and felt good about it, but now I couldn't stop thinking about it. The aboga was telling me without using words or pictures that my decision was somehow tainted or contaminated. I was trying to figure out what it was telling me when suddenly I had a very vivid recollection of something that happened when I was four or five years old something I'd forgotten about, at least I thought I had. It was Sunday and my mother was getting my little brother and me ready for church, as she did every Sunday. That day I decided I wanted to wear my favorite pair of overalls to church. Mom wanted me, mom me to wear a dress and I was so upset I was crying. I remembered her looking me in the eye and saying, Honey, what will people think if you walk into church wearing overalls? All the other little girls will be wearing pretty dresses and everyone will be looking at you in your overalls. I've always prided myself on being independent and not worrying about the opinion of others, but now I can feel how deeply this had affected me. How so many decisions I've made in my life, from relationships to education to the clothes I wear, and yes, even my choice of career, have been made based on whether or not I thought other people would approve. And some of those people weren't even central to my life. It suddenly seemed like an utterly absurd thing to consider. I knew right then that this was something that wasn't going to have a hold on me any longer. I also knew I was taking that new job. 
Incidentally, that same night I resolved the issue I originally went in thinking about. The aboga just took me on a much needed detour before that. Two, I found myself in a place where I could see thought patterns laid out right in front of me, and I could basically swipe away the ones that didn't serve me, like a touch screen. It also had me confront some issues from my past and go through some of the emotions in order to release them. It was like being in a psychoanalytic playground of sorts. I could just move around in that space and work on different emotional patterns, seeing where they came from, why they were there, and how they no longer served me. Person number three. I put on some meditation music and grabbed a notebook. I started meditating. The first thing that came up was a feeling of love for my lost cat. She died weeks before. I cried for about five minutes. I let myself sink into that feeling of grief and decided I'd surrender to my body. I let my body take over and it changed my seating position and it also changed my breathing patterns. I had a series of really three really long exhales where I felt a giant cloud of grief escape through each breath. I felt much better after this. It's weeks later, and I still feel like that grief has gone from me. Mm. Person number four. I started thinking about my positive attributes. I felt like I could see the thoughts forming in my mind and floating up into the air, that something strange was happening. Little pieces of paper were attaching to each thought as it rose. I zoomed in and saw that these pieces <coughs> of paper all had qualifiers on them. The thought, I'm a loyal friend, had a note attached that said, so what, so were a lot of people. The thought, I'm a good father, said, of course you are. That's your responsibility, and so on. I realized that this is what I did whenever a compliment was, compliment was paid to me, even for myself, and saw how destructive and unkind this was. I didn't treat other people like this, so why was I doing it to myself? Then I saw all the pieces of paper detach themselves from the thoughts and fall to the ground. More thoughts came, one after another, so quickly I didn't have time to think them. They started stacking up on top of one another and took the shape of a human form, kind of like a spacesuit. In my mind, I stepped into that suit and fully felt for the first time in a long time that I was truly a good person. No qualifiers. I think those are very powerful stories. Yeah. Are you okay with questions, Gary? Sure. Um, You're not supposed to heckle, but sure. Okay. <laughs> I don't mind. Um, so those were all experiences of combining microdose with cannabis? That was okay. this exact combination, yeah. First Low time? Doses. Uh, first, second time for one person, yeah. Root bark. Root bark, yeah. All of these are root bark. <coughs> so how do you go about doing a micro flood dose? What I've discovered is there, there's a two-step process that doesn't exactly mimic the flood dose, but there are two, part, two parts to this. There is taking the aboga and 30 minutes in smoking cannabis, at which point you'll have some pretty clear thoughts similar to what you're seeing in these stories. Two hours in, the ibogaine starts to peak. If you smoke at stage two, you can sort of burn things into your brain. It's a little more intense. It's a little more vivid visually. It's a little harder to hold on to. It's a little harder to mold to be mobile. But I'll describe it. So in preparation, research your possible health risks. If you smoke cannabis, I recommend abstaining, abstaining when you first start microdosing. You want to be able to feel the effects of the aboga on its own. And a high tolerance to cannabis, I've seen kill this process. Someone has to get off of cannabis if they want to do this for at least four or five days. Anytime you're microdosing, you should start off with an extremely small amount of the medicine just to make sure you're not allergic to it or you don't have some adverse reaction. You can start with something like 10 or 15 milligrams <coughs> of root bark. Just find out if it agrees with you. You can build up slowly. Remember, 15% of the ibogaine you consume is active in your system three days after you dose. Pay attention to your mood and energy level. If you start feeling tired or run down, you should probably back off a little. Think of some questions you like answered. Why do I think this? When did I start doing or thinking this and why? What would it be like if I started doing this? Then take a break from microdosing for five or more days. On the day of, have a quiet, darkened, or mostly darkened space ready where you can lay down in solitude. This is something you should do by yourself. It's not really a social activity. Have some music ready to play. I highly recommend starting with witty music. Later on, things like solfaggio tunes and binaural beats are very effective too, but I recommend starting with weekly music, at least in the first stage. Keep a pen and paper handy or something to record thoughts and observations with because they will come quickly and they'll disappear just as quickly. I've had thoughts come up and thought, holy shit, I can't believe that I realized this and then it's gone. So write things down or record them as quickly as you can. Have some cannabis ready to smoke. Have some water or coconut, coconut water handy. Set an intention for the journey. That's very important. 
and I recommend having a sitter nearby, especially the first time you work with this medicine. So I would say that a good dose is probably somewhere around 300 milligrams of root bark, not of HCL, not of ibogaine, not of extract of any kind of root bark. Place a small amount of the medicine on and under your tongue. It's going to taste like wood because it's wood. It's kind of bitter and it's going to numb your mouth for a while, but I think it's good to come in with the medicine. State your intention out loud so that you can hear it and the medicine can hear it. Take the balance of the medicine. When you start to feel the effects about 20 or 30 minutes in, it's a little bit of a stimulant. You'll feel it, you'll know. Repeat your intention out loud. Mean it. I always give the medicine permission to heal me. I give this medicine permission to heal me. I think that's very effective, especially with the boga. Go to your quiet place, look at your questions and think about them. That's why you've been researching this. This is your objective. Get comfortable and smoke a small amount of cannabis and then give that medicine permission to heal you. When I smoke the cannabis, I say, I give these medicine permission to heal me. Start your music. I use headphones. Dark in the room, have a light source ready if you want to be writing things down. Think about your intention and think about your questions. The medicine might take you somewhere else, like it did in some of those stories, but that's okay. Once again, write down and record your insights. Try not to get distracted by visual phenomenon, because that can happen, but please try to keep thinking. You can follow wormholes and do all kinds of cool things with it, but try to think about your questions and your intentions. And be careful when you're standing up or walking for the first time. At stage two, that's the two hour mark, the IV is gonna be peaking. You'll actually feel like you came down a little bit after you smoke cannabis at, 30, at the 30 minute mark and then you don't for another you know, hour, 90 minutes. You'll feel like it's kind of wearing off. If you're hungry, you can eat something and I guarantee you if you do, it's gonna be the best that thing that you ever ate in your life. <laughs> and you'll feel every bite and every flavor and feel how the food processes in your mouth and slowly goes down your throat. You're gonna ask me if you're gonna get sick when you eat. You're eating when you're doing it. You're doing a very small amount. So the usual nausea and things like yeah. that, ataxia, you know, Falling over when you stand up doesn't happen. You're only talking about 300, 400 milligrams of root bark. So yeah, you can eat comfortably. That's awesome. Yeah. A food enthusiast, I like that. <laughs> Get to your comfortable spot again and start smoking cannabis again. When you do, I would recommend looking at the notes that you took. What you're doing now is burning into your brain the realizations that you had in the first stage. And things will come to you and you'll look at things. I should say too that this is the only medicine I've ever worked with that's psychedelic that work in which setting doesn't matter. I took it one time and I was upset about something and I thought this is not a good time to be taking this medicine. My setting's not right. And as soon as it wore on, it told me what was wrong with that issue, yeah. what was going on with it, and I calmed down. I was fine. So things are going to come to you in stage one that you'll want to burn into your brain. This is when you're burning it into your brain. When you start smoking cannabis, you're going to get intense head rushes and you're going to feel like you're talking to your subconscious. You're going to want to hold on to what you're trying to get into your brain from stage one. Anything else that comes to you. I would recommend visualizing and telling yourself as strongly as possible whatever it is you're trying to get across to yourself. Other possibilities. This is a neurohacking tool I've discovered. It's not just a teacher, it's a neurohacking tool. Uh, Stan Brock did something that... that, that uh, entheogen-assisted therapy in the 60s before LSD was made Schedule 1. He did something called reframing work. You go back to a time in your life when you didn't do something or something happened to you that you don't think affected you positively, when you wish you stood up to yourself, said no, something happened, someone did something, you remember that. You get into that feeling intense, as intensely as you possibly can. You really feel that depression, that sadness, that anger, whatever it was. And when you really feel it, tell yourself the story differently. You said no. You stood up to yourself. That person didn't hurt you. That person didn't hurt you. The theory is that we don't really remember data or events as much as we remember the way we remember them. We also remember things the way we remember them last. This is why details get more and more foggy as time goes on. We forget things. Because you don't remember when this thing happened. You remember the last time you remembered it. When something negative happened to us, we attach a charge to it. Something bothers us. Bothers us. There's no difference between your memory of me speaking when I started this talk and your memory of something traumatic happening, except you've attached an emotion to it. You can discharge that emotion to a certain extent. Remember it the way that you want it to happen, and you can discharge that. Then you can remember it the way that it happened. When you go back and remember it again, it's going to be discharged a lot. 
You can do shadow work. Remembering something that happened in your life that you can't control. But this medicine is extremely empathogenic, so you can go back and remember it from a very compassionate point of view. And forgive yourself or someone else. Your brain loves what if questions. This is why you worry so much. What if I don't make enough money? What if I didn't do this? What if I didn't turn that off? So if you ask things in a what if format, your brain loves to grab onto that. So asking yourself what if questions is if what if what if I did this differently? What if I was more motivated? What if I wanted to do this? What if I stopped that habit? It's very effective with this medicine. Positive reinforcement is pretty obvious. Sending love to your pain is a very interesting, interesting thing to do when you're such an, in such an empathogenic state. Your pain's a part of you. When you push it away, you're pushing away part of yourself. If you go and you accept that pain and send it some love, it changes the nature of your relationship with it. If you do any energy or somatic work, I practice something called uh, trauma release exercise in which you tremor, and I've released a lot of trauma from my body. If you do energy work like Reiki or anything like that, or even body work, it's extremely effective with this medicine. Talking to yourself in the mirror is not always a good, t good idea with psychedelics. <laughs> <laughs> but with this medicine, it's really effective. You're actually talking to yourself, and it might kind of freak you out at first, and it might be kind of hard to hold your glance, your gaze, and it might be kind of hard to talk to yourself, but it's extremely effective when you use this medicine. Ask yourself some of your questions in the mirror. You might answer them. Mm -hmm. Think about the people in your life. The boga is extremely pathogenic. Um, I have had the chance to be around people on this medicine, and it can change the nature of the relationship with them. Mm -hmm. When you're using this medicine, it's important, and, and this has come up with shamans I've read several times, that say you don't worry about how to do it, just do it. Don't worry about how the medicine is doing or going to do something, just let it work. If it feels a little too strong or intense, you can eat something. That slows down the cannabis. You can always smoke more and go back in. When you've completed your journey, try to stay quiet, not get distracted. Your brain's going to be highly malleable and suggestible. Think about what you've learned and what kind of changes you're going to make as a result of that. Concentrate on that. Your brain is now waiting for you to demonstrate what the changes in your life will look like. Don't go back to your normal routine. Do something differently, even if you brush your hand with your, your teeth with your non-dominant hand. Try to get out into nature, get into a different setting, get around different people, give yourself a break. If you go right back into your old setting and your old habits, your brain's going to say, oh, that's right, this is what we do. Yeah. Do something differently. Mm -hmm. Try to eat well. There's not really a reason for that except for why wouldn't you do that? <laughs> if you're telling your brain this is what your life looks like now, why would you not eat better and tell your brain this is what we do? Something like meditation or, or yoga can be very grounding. Massages or other body work feel fantastic after an experience like this. I recommend reading through or listening to your notes after the experience trying to remember how you felt when you recorded them. Anything educational or learning something new is great after this experience. And cannabis can reactivate a boga for at least a few days afterwards. I've also found that cannabis, cannabis changes after this. I'm sure most of you have the experience if you smoke cannabis that after you do psychedelics, cannabis becomes a little bit more psychedelic. Mm -hmm. It definitely becomes a little bit deeper and more introspective after using a boga. So keep that in mind. And it tends to, because of uh, you know, clearing off receptors and resetting levels, it tends to kind of reset your tolerance to cannabis too. So you might have a high tolerance to cannabis, you might not after this. Remember, if there's any behavior, habit, or anything at all you want to change in your life, now's the time to do that. Your brain is waiting for you to show it what your new life is going to look like. And with that, I'll say thank you and ask if there are any questions. Yes? Are you saying that you have visions? I wasn't really clear. Under the cannabis and electricity, you were having visions similar to other blood? You know, I haven't done a flood dose. I, I have understand. read and viewed, a, and I know a lot of people who've done a flood dose, so I don't think that they're comparable. But I know people have, and I have had powerful <laughs> visions using this combination. And I, I microdosed 
you know, I really mesodosed what I was talking about before. I got up to taking like 450, 500 milligrams at a time in microdosing because I was doing the same thing. I was trying to get that effect from the medicine and it was nothing like that. The second I added a small amount of cannabis, yeah, I had powerful visions. Sometimes they weren't exactly clear, but sometimes they were extremely clear and sometimes they were more my, me talking to myself than just visions. Well, it gets highly powerful and highly psychedelic. Can I follow that up with asking you? I'm not a real big cannabis fan, but I've done a couple of flood doses, so it's really attractive to have this kind of experience without getting a tactic and 30 days down and yeah. all of that. So different strains, do you recommend a strain of cannabis or can you tell like, what combinations give different effects? Yeah, I prefer sativa with it because it can, you know, the medicine itself can slow you down. You know how a boga is, it can slow you down. So rather than being more slowed down and getting more of a body load from indica, which I've done, that tends to weigh me down a little bit more. I, per I prefer sativa with it, but that's just my preference. Yeah. Is this available online by chance? You're um, I'm going to try to put it online, but I also have a protocol. If you see me afterwards, I can give you my contact information. Okay. Yes? So, have you tried this with anyone in a withdrawal setting at all? I have not tried this. No one that I've worked with with this combination has been done for addiction interruption. It's all been psychospiritual. All I don't have that experience or expertise. Yeah. 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 So okay. I don't know how it works for that, but I know that a lot of people have killed some really bad habits doing this. Yeah, imagine smoking yeah. would probably be, a, this would be an excellent way I to don't smoke. think that it would hurt. And I should also say when you mention like you're not a big cannabis fan, I, there are some people I know who don't really smoke cannabis, and there's some people who say I don't smoke cannabis anymore because I abuse it. I think I view this as more of a ceremonial celebratory. Yeah. <coughs> cool. oh. Sir, so you have an ayahuasca experience to share this to you? Do, I don't know. Talk about how how your meditation. Changed. Oh, meditation became a lot more intense. So did my so did my concentration. As far as ayahuasca, it's not really comparable to ayahuasca. I will say that this medicine is comparable to that, that space that you get into with ayahuasca or other psychedelics where you can see how your mind's working and you think, shit, that's why I'm doing that. That's why I thought that. Now I can see that. And I'm, you know, in psychedelics, sometimes you think something and you're in a space where you can just change it. You just happen to be in the right spot. That sweet spot that you get from psychedelics, that's what this medicine does. That's like taking that part of the psychedelic experience and extracting it into a psychedelic. That's why I like this so much. So yeah, it doesn't compare to an ayahuasca experience. It's much more literal in the way that it teaches you. A friend of mine once said, if you ask ayahuasca the meaning of life, it might show you a goat. So then you're like, you know, am I the goat? Is life the goat? I don't know what to do from here. You have to figure that out. That's not what this does. This gives you some very direct messages and lessons. It's a great teacher. Yes? Um. A little bit similar, um, but okay. So, like with the psycho spiritual work, do you have you worked with people with trauma, and have, you know maybe like something about like how this might compare to MDMA? You know? You know, I have not done, like, entheogen, entheogen assisted therapy with this. And I, I don't think, you know, I've talked about things like reframing and shadow work. Uh, this is not a replacement for therapy. And I, re I recommend anyone who's doing work on themselves actual, actually work with psychotherapists, too. It's been extremely valuable for me. So I don't know how it would work with something like trauma. I think it's very comparable to MDMA and its empathogenic effect. And I think it's a very strong connection to your subconscious. So I think that someone should definitely be looking into that, someone who has that qualification, which I don't. And if somebody has, like, like they know something in their history, but they don't know what it is, that's the kind of thing that you would really maybe pick up in this? They don't know what it is, as in it's a well, memory like there. Something you know something happened. Like PTSD, like I'm protecting myself well, by not remembering. Like it that. happened at four years old. Yeah, Actually, yeah. I, you know, I think someone should work with a therapist right. on something like right. that. Certainly, a medicine like this as part of a, a, a regimen, I think, would be helpful for that. Yeah, I definitely think that's something a psychotherapist should handle. You, know, you can't. I don't think you should just rip a bandaid off of something like that. There's a reason that your mind builds that protection. You know, there's a reason it's there, and I think that you need to be built up and fortified before you rip that bandaid off. Yeah. Do right anywhere. Um, I don't smoke, can't smoke, and I don't have anything jets, like edibles. So, because it does take 30, 40 minutes to come to effect anyway, would you suggest, like, just 
doing them all at the same time. Uh, so let me. Uh, when you say smoke, do you mean actual smoke? Yeah, kind of actual smoke. What about vapor? Can you vaporize? Um, no, I just said it was. Okay, but I mean, can you vaporize? Um, I'd probably try to stay away from that. Okay, because I, I know I know that someone has tried this with edibles, and I've two people tried it with oils, and they don't get the same effect. Wow. I mean, it's a different delivery system. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would say if you're going to do it with the edibles, what, what you're going to have to do is figure out a different schedule because the edibles can take up to two hours to get into your body. But then the other thing you got to understand is when you ingest marijuana, it's not THC that's the psychoactive ingredient that you're going to be feeling. It's something else with a really weird abbreviated number thing I can't remember, but it's actually 30 times more psychoactive than marijuana it's by smoking it. So you're going to have to take that into, into effect if you're going to eat it. I would say looking at it as, um, as he was saying, a sacrament or whatever, and looking at the vape thing that way. Okay. And just because he seems like have like a a way of doing it, and I think it would be a, a little trial and error to try to get it to match up right so mm -hmm. that you're getting the right amount off the edible at the same time that you're going to be on the root bark when it needs to happen. So that would probably be it, and then you're going to have the whole problem of uh, the level, the highness that you're going to get from the uh, weed, maybe. Uh, yeah, the psychoactive effect from edibles has never been the same for me. I mean, personally, I don't care for edibles. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I don't like throwing up, but I've taken a lot of ayahuasca, so I <laughs> think yourself a vaporizer, aren't gonna, they're not going to hurt your lungs like smoke for one thing, but sure. I just thought there's an investment rather than trying to, I mean, trial and oh, error, yeah. people can do what they want, but I know people have tried it, it's not quite the same, it's not the same sure. delivery system, it's not the same psychoactive effect. Does that help? Yes. Yes. Yeah, wait, can you clarify the, the way that you ingest it? You said put it on your tongue, and on your tongue, so you're not swallowing it? Oh, start off with it on your tongue or on your tongue. Yeah, you can swallow it after that. You know, the root bark comes in capsules. You can break open the capsule and get a little bit of that wood and put it under your tongue. I like to taste the medicine before it goes into my body. But then you can swallow it. Yeah, then you can swallow it in a capsule. I've also swallowed the the powder hole, you know, dumped out the whole capsule. Taking a little bit at first and then I'm taking the whole thing in powder. It comes on a little bit more quickly that way, obviously. It's not time to release. Yes. Uh, why do you recommend the root bark versus the total alkaloid? Um, I know. I'm only saying I only work with root bark. I, I think that total alkaloid, you know, tel total alkaloid, I, I don't have a problem with. I have read something recently where, you know, the Bwiti, who are sort of the indigenous people and keepers of this medicine, say that if you're going to do an extraction of some kind, total alkaloid is an extraction of all of the alkaloids. So you'll get all 12 alkaloids. You can use less of it, but they say you should be careful in that extraction that you don't lose the spirit of the so that's why I work with the whole medicine. Um, Ibogaine you mostly see used in clinical settings for two reasons. One is that you can't tell the strength of one plant, you know, a plant one from the next. One might be 45% Ibogaine, one might be 80% Ibogaine. So for purposes of dosing, it's easier, easier to use just Ibogaine. You can also use a lot less. Where you might be taking 15 grams of Iboga or spoons and spoons of this wood, you can just take a capsule of Ibogaine. But I have only worked with um, root bark and actually one time TA I got from someone. But all I'm pointing out is that the dosages for all of those different extractions and Ibogaine and things are different. So if I talk about 300 milligrams, don't take 300 milligrams of Ibogaine yeah, yeah. expecting the same thing. That's 300 milligrams of root bark. So just you know, do your research and know how to extrapolate that. Okay. Yes? I'm just curious. Uh, this is a really interesting talk. Thank you. I've heard that there are parallels between ibogaine and ketamine, and I'm curious about that. I don't know if you can comment on that in terms of you know, the chemical composition, the way it affects the brain, and also the experience. I haven't worked with ketamine, but I know people who have, and I know it's it's more of a dissociative yeah. um, than an entheogen. So I know people who've been helped by it in therapeutic settings. I know people who've used it to to sort of escape and more of a celebratory rather than recreational say I might say and I know people who've lost themselves by going down the cable and completely forgetting who they were um, and it's not comparable to ego death from what I understand so I don't know how it compares because I haven't worked with ketamine but I certainly as far as um, how it affects you I don't think they're they're similar 
is, uh, is Ibogaine not associated with them associated? No, Ibogaine is described, some people describe it as an entheogen or psychedelic. Some people describe it as, as an or, or neurogenic or, or a neurogen. A neurogenic herbs are those that promote or create dreams or intensify dreams. But really, it is, it's a psychoactive tryptamine, so it's a psychedelic. Yeah, I've, I've experienced with both, and I mean, there's like an element of a ketamine experience in ibogaine. It does have like a little bit of a dissociative quality, and um, you have like a little bit of a distance from your emotions and thought processes. They they definitely feel way different, um, and ibogaine does affect the same in like, MDA receptors as um, ketamine, but it, it feels very different. Yeah, I know someone who's used ketamine a lot who's also used this particular combination. He, says this, he doesn't see a comparison, except for, like you say, you can stand back. It's like with MDMA, it's the same reason they use MDMA therapy, because you can be detached from traumatic thoughts. Yes? I was just wondering, um, I know you haven't done ibogaine in the reflectives, but from, from your observations and talking to people that have, um, are you aware of any benefits outside of people not having the medical um, stance necessary to do the IV blood of, of that versus a uh, microdose? Uh, no, they're different animals, and I think there's certainly a place for microdosing, but they're completely, you know, when you when you do a microdose, you're hoping to eventually realize some of the effects when it builds up in your system. You know, so maybe I can start seeing why I have particular patterns, you know, behaviors, addictions, or what have you. Maybe I can get my mood elevated. Maybe I can sleep better. Whereas, you know, you just plow through all of that in a flood dose. A flood dose is a very intense uh, experience where you're shown all of these things all at one time. It just gives it all of, all to you and then lets you work it out over the next hours, days, weeks, and months following the experience. So they're very different experiences. I haven't done the flood dose, but I do know that they're very different. So a lot of people microdose, a lot of people can't afford it. They might be a medical condition, they don't have time for it, they can't travel. So yeah, those are some of the reasons that I know about from people that I know. Yes? Do you have a recommended cadence of microdosing in this way? Because you talked about people that were kind of building up a kind of tolerance or maybe kind of flatulating out and not using it in the best way. Is there like a cadence you'd recommend that someone's going to incorporate this into their life? There is a, you know, when you look at different protocols for microdosing Evoga or Ibogaine, it's a wild west out there right now. You know, from people who are microdosing 10 to 15 milligrams every day to people who are uh, uh, microdosing 200 milligrams every four days, the protocols are all over the map. I would say experience, you know, experiment, see what works for you, start off slow and put a few days in between is what I would recommend. I'd recommend at least a couple of days in between so it doesn't build up in your system too quickly. Yes. I would say also for anyone who's wanting to experience ibogaine or blood microdose and whatever it is, the thing that mattered the most to me was finding someone who had already been down that road for the similar reasons that I had went down it and the connection that I had with them. And then a lot of stuff started making up more sense with the ibogaine, whether it be microdosing or blood dosing, I've done both. I think there's immense, immense potential with microdosing. As far as I can tell with, with the Ibogaine and my relationship with it, I've the, the, the intense psychedelic experience was very profound for me and it, it changed, saved my life. It changed my life. It empowered me to, to do what I needed to do in my life to actually live. And <coughs> With microdosing, it might it might not be so easy to to see or understand what you're hearing. But when you take ibogaine, whether it be TA, root bark, HCO, your your body's turning that into nora ibogaine, and that stuff's going to your brain, and that plant is talking to you. And with the thing that intrigues me so much is about this is because of the smoking sativas, it it gives you that introspective feeling where I feel like. If you can do this microdosing and, and have the willingness to, to believe that this is a very strong spirit that's in your body talking to you, and you find someone who's been through it and understands what that is, and they can kind of just 
They don't even need to coach you or guide you or nothing. They just need to really be there because we're all connected. And that's what this stuff does. It shows you that we're all connected on a very intense level. And I think that's a, an important part of it. Find someone that you have a connection with and it does, for me, make the whole experience that much better and, and uh, I get that much more out of it. All right, thanks. Man. There's a question over here. <clears throat> I was just asking something that I think you answered and it was, you know, the how long you wait between and, and you know, advising that for the a beginner or something. Oh, for and then how you do it for life, years, I mean, you continue doing it. Yeah, the, the norambigin does metabolize in your liver once it gets to a certain level. Um, I think with with um, Evoca, once you've been microdosing for a while, you can figure that out. You can back off and see how you feel. Um, some people reported after a flood dose that for the following six months they felt like they could do anything, and after six months it sort of wore off and the shine sort of came off of everything, and it was time to do the work themselves, which I think is also important. You know, you get support from the medicine, then you're kind of on your own. Yes, Helen? I have. Um Excuse me. Uh, uh, first, I wanted to say we have um, the folks doing the ballot initiative for psilocybin here. So when we're done with this, they're going to come speak. So everybody, like, hey, okay. Um The other thing, I've heard ibogaine is really good for um, like bacterial infections in your stomach, like SIBO and candida. And I'm wondering if you've heard anything about microdosing for gut health. No, I know nothing about that, actually. It's the first I've heard that. I just heard about it, but yeah. That's interesting. I'm going to have to look into it. I know for me, like, um, I began just, like, completely cured all my GI issues for several years. It's really? like, that was probably, like, one of the most dramatic effects of it. And, like, maybe that was candida or I don't know. But it's definitely known to, like, definitely candida and, like, parasites. And SIBO, like, SIBO is so hard to treat. Which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth that causes uh, IBS symptoms and bloating, distension, diarrhea, constipation, just depending, um, and it's very, it's really hard to treat, and I'm just thinking, like, outside of everything else, this could maybe be really good for that. Condoms. Get some subjects. Yes? I just wanted to clarify, I heard you said, uh, sativa, um, cannabis is your preferred, um, but I'm wondering if it makes a difference if you use THC, how you yeah, you know, sativa is just a preference for me overall. When I smoke indica, I'll be on the couch eating Doritos and watching TV. <laughs> um, I'm not going to do much else, so I prefer sativa. That's a little more active. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't get as weighed down by sativa, and I can think more clearly. And to me, part of this process is being able to think clearly, because especially in stage two of this process, it's you have to hang on to your hat at times. You have to be able to think. You have to hang on to a thought, wow. and it's hard to do sometimes. Right, and is there a difference? Well, I think that, you know, the THC is obviously more psychoactive, you know, I, I think that the THC, I've tried uh, CBD heavy without much THC in it, and I found that it didn't potentiate the, the evoca as, as strongly. Yes? Yeah, I, I just wanted to make a comment about the uh, uh, potential GI benefits, and uh, I'm not certain about the causality here, but it's when uh, I addressed all my GI issues and got rid of them, my cholesterol problems disappeared. Wow. Yes? Uh, I just wanted to, I think somebody earlier mentioned, or you mentioned the um, Evoca versus Ibogaine, where you could feel the, um, the um, spirit of the plant, and I just want to share my experience that I've done both, Ibogaine and Evoca. Sure. And I found the spirit of the plant just as strong, if not stronger, with my Ibogaine experience. Good. Um, and the, the Evoca experience was definitely smoother, it was less intense because it wasn't as, you know, compact. Mm -hmm. And to address the trauma issue, I went, the Ibogaine took me back to a um, birth trauma that I didn't even know I had. Mm -hmm. And completely wiped it out, cleared it, and and I was reversed. Yeah. I had no idea that I was going to go into that place. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. Greg, hey, uh, you mentioned you took some medication for seizure, controlled seizure. Dilantin. Sorry? Dilantin. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, I just was curious to know, following your experience with Ibogaine, whether or not you, you felt any difference with him in terms of your relationship with that medication, or that experience. Now the problem with, uh, you know, a lot of people have talked to me about, you know, using cannabis oil and things like that while you're taking this medication. The problem that I have is, uh, at 20 years old, I had a grand mal seizure out of nowhere. So I'm talking to you, and the next thing I know, I'm waking up, and the paramedics are there, and I've exercised every bo every muscle in my body as much as I possibly can, and bitten my cheeks and tongue to the extent that it's going to take two weeks for that to clear up. It's the most unpleasant experience I've ever had in my life. Um, I tried getting off the medication a couple times, and actually I screwed up and didn't take enough med medication a couple times and had a seizure. So in order to get off of that and change my relationship with that medicine, I basically have to be isolated in a rubber room, not drive, hope I don't fall down to the sidewalk. So I haven't visited that, and no one's told me that my relationship has changed. So um, I have my blood tested regularly. I check to see if it's impacting my liver. It doesn't. So I haven't tried to get off of that medication for those reasons. Yeah, I wish it was as simple as that. I wish you could stop taking it and see if things were better. But unfortunately, that might mean that when I'm walking down the stairs tonight, I have a seizure and fall down a flight of stairs. Yeah, no, I understand. But your answer, I like your answer a lot. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Um, uh, how much cannabis do you suggest that you smoke? Like, you know, when during the stages or in total, is there like? I suggest that you start off slow and see where you are, because you'll know pretty quickly if you're in a productive stage. Mm -hmm. um, you can overshoot this. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, this has been sort of being beta tested, and yeah, you can overshoot this with too much aboga and too much cannabis, and get too high and not get the experience that mm -hmm. you want. I would just suggest, you know, when I do it, I use a vaporizer. If I'm smoking normally in order to get a, a high and relax, I can take four or five hits off of a vaporizer and I'm good. Mm -hmm. Two or three hits off a vaporizer with this, and I'm good. This will also increase your tolerance to cannabis. So if you decide later on in stage two and you're in a comfortable place, you can smoke two, three, four times as much cannabis as you're used to, and this will let you do that and go into an extremely deep experience. Mm -hmm. But I recommend starting off slow, especially at the 30-minute <laughs> mark. The 30-minute mark is where you're going to have a kind of a clear thinking space where uh -huh. you can realize, like I said, I went and I was uptight about something. And very quickly, the, the boga showed me why I was uptight about it and the cause of it, and I was sort of clear that if I'd have gotten really high, that might not have happened. Wait, so you got you smoked at the thirty-minute mark or the two-hour mark? Thirty-minute mark. Thirty-minute mark. A, a little bit. Yeah, you know, I'll probably when I'm smoking at the thirty-minute mark, I'll probably off of vaporizer take three or four hits. Uh -huh. At the two-hour mark, I might do that plus a little bit more. Okay. I should also men okay. mention at the two-hour mark, things like pranayama will intens intensify it greatly. Mm -hmm. Things like if you use rape, shamanic snuff, and you're oh. used to that, mm -hmm. yeah, that will that will send you down a, a sort of a rabbit hole <laughs> and send you into a very deep experience. Wow. And at least at small doses, this this plays very well with psilocybin mm -hmm. at doses wow. of like one to one and a half grams. Yeah, that was a very intense yeah. experience. You said you use rape. Yes. Oh yeah. Wow. Okay. What are you doing with psilocybin? Psilocybin, at one time I used it with psilocybin, I did the psilocybin uh, and waited for the psilocybin to come up, you know, which took about 45 minutes to an hour, and while that was coming up, took the aboga and then smoked the cannabis regularly. But even something like pranayama will give you a very deep experience, especially at that two-hour mark. How intense is the rape? Sorry, what? The rape. Extremely intense. I I'm, I'm used to it. I use it as part of my daily practice. Okay, but yeah, cool. it's extremely intense. You know, I use um, a more medicinal level when I'm doing that. Yeah. Can you we don't understand what you just said. Um, uh, about rape? Yeah. Rape is um, what's called shamanic stuff, snuff. It generally comes from South America. It's powdered mapacho tobacco along with powdered ashes from different trees and plants. It's administered into the nasal cavity. Oh, can you spell it? It's R A P E with the little mark over it, whatever that's called. What is that called? Accent mark. Yeah. It's also, it's also called sometimes hape, H A P E. Yeah, hape. Yes. Depending on where you're at, I think it's rape in Brazil and hape in Peru or something like that. Wow. Yes. Experiences of people getting I think it shows, you know, 
this is your brain. This is you talking to your brain, and your brain talking to you. I think whatever you're used to seeing, the way that you digest information, the, the easiest, the way it's more, more, the most entertaining to you. I think it helps you. It helps you in that way. Um, I personally just heard it talking to me without seeing. But like I said, that first time I was seeing things happening in front of me, and I generally don't picture my thoughts that much. But this was doing that for me. And it had much more of an impact on me when I did that. When I saw what the person said, the effect on me, and it turned, I could see it much better, and it had more of an impact on me. Hmm. Was it like yes. Sort of, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. Sort of like synesthesia. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Hey, so I have a comment and a question. Comment, I just want to say for people that aren't familiar with Hafei, uh, I actually just created a, a few videos, which I put up on YouTube demonstrating how to use it, an interview with the shaman from the Amazon all about it. If you just look at Tara Rose, Sacred Medicine, you'll see it. Um, and then my question is, uh, the way you're describing this experience reminds me a lot of the experiences I've had just working with cannabis alone. Mm -hmm. But what I'm wondering about is if you had these introspective experiences with cannabis alone and how you could compare the microdose of yoga to the really strong Experiences with cannabis, where like you see Have you heard of Daniel McQueen? Mm -hmm. He runs an organization called Medicinal Mindfulness in uh, Colorado. And he has something called Conscious Cannabis Circles, where people gather, uh, they do meditation, they do pranayama, and he has a, a blend of 11 different strains of cannabis from Colorado. They know what they're doing there. <laughs> and they play extremely emotive music. music hand everyone a pipe with that cannabis and tell you to smoke as much as you can. They don't even like you to drive after this, to go as deeply into the cannabis experience as you can, put on an eye mask, and listen to this music. It was one of the most powerful experiences I've ever had just with cannabis, but it didn't match this. I had, you know, cannabis for me is very introspective, and I have had a lot of very good experiences with it, but this potentiates it, you know, uh, I, I don't even know how many times, you know. There's no comparison, even the most powerful cannabis experience I ever had, there is no comparison to that with just 300 milligrams of aboga and half that much cannabis. Definitely. So yeah, and then, but I should say that after that, cannabis' effect on me, the effect that cannabis has on me did change quite a bit, and it's much more introspective and much more powerful now. What, what was his name? Daniel McQueen, he runs an organization called Medicinal Mindfulness. Yes. I will say I use I use cannabis in a kind of different way, more of a sacrificial way, but kind of along the same lines, is along the same lines as she does. And, and the way I use it, it's, it's really powerful. I mean, it's almost as soon as I begin to smoke it, and it, I immediately feel with uh, just a, a powerful spiritual experience. So what I'm saying is, in my opinion, the cannabis it, it, it opens the door, but there's there is a spiritual side to this that, that's there also, and and and, and, and the cannabis is almost illusory. Almost as soon as I start it, it my, my whole body is just like flooded with, with, with my thing. But it's it's not the cannabis. It's like it that that only opens the door. I mean, as far as I can see, at least the way that I'm interpreting it now. But I know that's strange, but it uh, it kind of goes along with the lines of what she's saying. By cannabis alone, she was able to have these amazing experiences. And what I'm saying is that it's not necessarily the cannabis only. It may be something else with it. All right, thank you. I think we should take one more. It looks like the other speakers are here. So, um, in regards to microdosing uh, yoga, um, I microdose psilocybin currently, and I was concerned about maybe mixing the two. Uh, I take about 130 milligrams a day, five, like usually about four days on or so on. I've been doing it for months, and um, I was just wondering if, um, do, if I, if you think it's okay to maybe. Incorporate the aboga in a microdose and the same, maybe 100 milligrams or something like that. I know no one who's doing that, so I don't know. 100 <laughs> milligrams is not a, that's, that's not uh, an insignificant microdose. Okay. 100 milligrams is, I think, I think a microdose is probably <coughs> closer to 20, 25, 40 milligrams mm -hmm. maybe, but you know, do what works for you. I mean, yeah. Uh, I would say try and see what happens. Like I say, it, it seemed the, the spirits of those two medicines seem to get along very well when I use them okay. together. Mm -hmm. uh, I had never tried it out in Boga, so I'm really interested though. Okay. One more question. Yeah, you mentioned the amount when you incorporated uh, psilocybin. How much did you add for the Iboga? Um, how much did you take? You mean how much Iboga did I take? Well, I assume you, you did the same amount of Iboga, but you added 
Yeah, yeah I gra added a gram and a half of psilocybin. A gram and a half. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to leave a couple cards with Helen, so if anyone has questions or wants to reach out, I do have a protocol that sort of details out this process, and if everyone's interested, just reach out to me. And we're also recording this and putting it on YouTube. Uh, Portland Psychedelic Society has a YouTube channel, so you can check there. So anyway, thank you. That was thank awesome. You.